I, I don't know if you've thought recently about your vision. I've been thinking a little bit about mine. Uh, I have had spectacular vision my entire life. One of the, I mean, maybe I took false pride in it, I don't know. But um, I, like I could see things ahead of anybody else, and I could read in low light, and all those kind of things. About the time I hit 50, that started to change. And um, um, some of you can identify with that. Uh, I mean, to have great vision, to have great eyesight is an enormous blessing. Uh, it, it is such a rich gift to have and when you start losing it it's, uh, I, I haven't quite surrendered to it yet um, so um, you can pray for me in that um, if you struggle with eyesight I'm, I'm really sorry like I realize you know if some people really adapting to eyewear is really difficult or, or yeah I, it, it, it is really really tough and I empathize with you uh, on that um, Jesus this morning is inviting us to see we're going to open up John chapter 9 and uh, the healing of the man who was born blind and uh, he's, he's inviting us to see but it, it, the invitation really is a spiritual invitation it's an invitation to see with spiritual eyes a work that God is doing around us um, some of you know what I mean when I talk about suddenly being able to see uh, with, with spiritual eyes many of you have a very distinct before Jesus and after Jesus story to tell. Uh, there was a before, it was a night and day kind of story that you would tell. And Jesus in, in chapters eight and nine is promising, uh, well, he's promising light in dark places. May this light be to you in dark places, uh, a light when all other lights fail. Uh, some of you will enjoy that quote. Others are like, I don't know what he's talking about. Um, uh, Jesus is, in pro- is, is, is promising that we would be able to see um, what is otherwise, without, without his intervention, would be actually impossible uh, to see. Uh, by the time we get to this part of the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus is, is quite frankly becoming a superstar. Uh, people are coming from far and wide. There have, there have been huge crowds who have come uh, to encounter Jesus. And it's no surprise that by the time we get to John chapter 12, uh, which is the account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem that we're recalling on this Palm Sunday, um, it, man, the guy is a superstar. He, he has been healing people, and people want more. Uh, he, has been, uh, he has been teaching people, and, and people want better instruction. They, they, no, they've never heard anybody teach like this. Uh, people who couldn't walk are walking. People who couldn't see are seeing. And, and people have gathered because they realize something extraordinary is taking place. Well, well, th- there are even accounts, by the time you get to that first Palm Sunday, of people being raised from the dead. Uh, we'll talk about that a couple of Sundays from now. We'll get to John chapter 11. And so it's no surprise that in the lead up to these events, uh, there's a lot of hurrah going on. There's a lot of disturbed, there are a lot of disturbed people saying, what the heck? And and some of them are getting their tails in a knot pretty seriously. So so this morning, we're in John chapter 9. Um, your, your kids, by the way, are in John 12 and parallel passages in the Gospels. They're going to be talking about Palm Sunday. So maybe you want to read up on it and then have a conversation with them this afternoon. Just saying. Okay, read John chapter 12. It's Palm Sunday. And, and, and know that they've been, But ask them, what did they learn? Tell me the story. Uh, it, it's a great way just to interact with your kids around the scriptures and to become part of their instruction, uh, their instructors to it. But this morning we're in John chapter 9, and Jesus is inviting us to see. The light of the world is offering to illuminate your life and everything around you. That's that's an invitation I want to respond to. I want to understand what he's doing. I want to understand where he's going. Uh, uh, But but it begins with a, a, a fundamental first step, which is this yes to God in in belief. Maybe you'd bow with me in prayer. We'll just invite we'll just invite the teacher himself, Holy Spirit, to come to prompt us in this. Holy Spirit, we, we acknowledge that you are, are the teacher. I'm a, a frail stand-in. Would you come and teach us from your word this morning? And, and Jesus, we long that you would come and shine the light of your love into our lives. We ask that you would illuminate your word 
that you would engage our minds and that you would warm our hearts that we might see, that we might understand, and that we might respond to you. Father God, we ask this in the name of Jesus as we pray to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. So follow along, if you will, please. I'm going to read uh, from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. We'll take it kind of in segments this morning. It'll be on the screens here for you and at home. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. It, It titles this section, Jesus Heals a Man Born Blind. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud from, with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was. Others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Where is he now? They asked. I don't know, he replied. And then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. It's the word of the Lord. So on the Sabbath, we're pretty certain that it's not just Sabbath, a.k.a. Saturday on the Jewish calendar, but they were actually still in the Feast of Booths. I got a picture here uh, to kind of remind us. A couple of weeks ago, we were talking about this. The Feast of Booths, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, it goes by multiple names, the Feast of Sukkot, uh, the Feast of the Ingathering. Now, does anyone remember what window of time in the calendar the Feast of Booths takes place? Do you recall? It's in the fall. It's in the autumn. Uh, and, and, and you remember, um, there are several things that uh, were distinctive about the Feast of Booths. Um, uh, it featured bright lights, that's right. Uh, they, they would go down in a procession to the Pool of Siloam to get what? Get water. They'd bring it back up to the temple. They'd pour it out on the altar. Um, and, and what was the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles or Sukkot? What was it uh, hearkening back to? What were they remembering from their history? Do you recall? The Exodus. Okay, so it's about the Exodus. And, and there were two things in particular about the Exodus that was, um, that was being celebrated. Do you recall what those would be? It's getting harder. We're celebrating God's his presence and his provision. And you may recall, just a chapter or so before this, in the Gospel of John, Jesus does what God does, God stuff. He, he fed 5,000 people miraculously with bread. Harkened back to the Exodus. Harkened back to God's provision of his people. Well, Jesus is doing God stuff. He walked across the water, God stuff. And and John is inviting us to see the cues that are connected because there's a bunch of dots here which are are, are signs. He's going to use the language. We'll talk about that in a moment. But if we connect the dots, what we're going to see is that that there's this invitation to see, for our eyes to be opened, for us to be illuminated and, and our lives and everything in them to begin to make eternal sense. 
Now, as we work our way from there toward chapter nine, and this account that we just read of the man who was born blind, we've got to ask a couple of questions about this idea of God illuminating our lives. What's involved in this idea that Jesus is the light of the world? What is this light that dispels darkness? Now, chapter eight, I think we're supposed to understand that it's in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. The Jewish leaders dragged this, this Jewish woman into the temple courts, so it's a crowded place, and they publicly, they're publicly shaming her, they're publicly abusing her because these religious leaders were trying to frame Jesus. Would Jesus, would Jesus deny the law of Moses and what it said about the sin of adultery, or would Jesus deny the life of this woman and participate in this public shaming and what would ultimately be an execution? And Colleen Jansen walked us through that lovely, wonderfully last Sunday. If you missed it, go back and check the recording of it. But but that account takes place in the middle of the Feast of Booths. Right following this, we read this, John chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Some scholars think that he spoke that as the big candlesticks that were in our picture, uh, the big candlesticks in the temple court were extinguished. And he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Okay, now, are you connecting some dots here that, that, that John wants us to connect? Do you see the darkness of the Pharisees' actions and behavior, beginning of chapter 8, their, their abuse of this woman, their treatment of this woman, in contrast to the brightness of Jesus, grace and mercy? Now, he, he says, now go and leave your life of sin. But there's extraordinary grace that's present in this relationship. And it's all in the context of this feast where the water's poured out and Jesus, end of, uh, end of chapter seven, says, come to me and, and from your innermost being streams or rivers of living water will flow. And, and after this account where this woman has been horrifically treated, uh, we, we come to him saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And we say, okay, well, that's nice, but but it feels a little intangible to me right now. Like, like, like what are you really talking about, Jesus? Like, how how do I access this water, these streams of living water? What would Jesus told us? He said, come to me. So we start to say, okay, these metaphors are, are saying kind of the same thing, but in different ways and inviting us to see and respond to what Jesus is saying. So, so if I come to you in order to get streams of living water, what do I need to do in order to experience the light of life in me? And he tells us, chapter 8, verse 51. Remember, we're working our way to the blind man here. I'm trying connecting dots for you here. Chapter 8, verse 51, I tell you the truth. Anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. Streams of living water, light of life, obeys my teaching will never die. We're connecting these threads together. Now at this point, if you're just kind of jumping in with us and you haven't been with us since the beginning of the Gospel of John, you might say, what the heck? Like, who is this Jesus to be making such extraordinary claims? Now, if you've been with us since the beginning, it's no surprise because John starts out and he says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Word, a.k.a. Jesus. The Word was with God in the beginning. Nothing was made that has been made that he didn't make. So John is very, very clear about who Jesus is. What if you're just jumping in with us now? Have a look at this. End of chapter 8. Again, we're working our way to chapter 9 and the man born blind. End of chapter 8, Jesus says, they've been, they've been fussing with him. They've been giving a terrible hard time. You can read that. It's, it's, it's a fascinating reading. But here's, here's the conclusion of chapter 8. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. Now, we've talked about this before. I am ego, a me in the Greek how the 
Greek translation of the Old Testament treated Exodus chapter 3 when God appeared to Moses in the bush and said, I want you to go back to my people and bring them out of slavery. And he says, who should, send, who should I tell them sent me? And he says, tell them the I am sent you. Are you connecting the dots here? Like, like, it's so utterly clear. Jesus is absolutely connecting himself, identifying himself with Yahweh, the I am, and repeatedly he'll use this turn of phrase, and the I am is now walking among us, God with skin on. He says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. They understood what he was saying, in case we don't. They picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. Nothing unclear about this. It is utterly obvious who Jesus is claiming himself to be. But not everyone is prepared to hear it. No, not everyone is prepared to believe it. This is the second time they've tried to kill him. Why would they do that? Because they're blind. They're blind. Thirsty people have come to him and they've been having their thirst satiated. Hungry people have come and he has fed them and we're being invited to look below the surface. Yes, these things really happened. But look below the surface. They're pointing to, pointing to a spiritual reality that we are supposed to be paying attention to, a spiritual need for food, a spiritual need for drink to be satiated, our, our thirsty souls, our thirsty lives, a spiritual need for our eyes to be opened, the eyes of our hearts to be opened to the spiritual realities that are going on around us. And we're seeing in stark contrast those who continue obstinately in darkness remain in darkness. They don't see it. They don't understand it. They're blind. In this case, they're worse than blind. They're guilty. We get to the end of the man born blind bet, and Jesus says this. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. They're not just blind. They're obstinate, and their obstinance leaves them guilty. Now before we get to that, ex that statement, we've got to come back to where we started this morning. Chapter 9, man born blind. What's going on with this account? Because this guy, from birth, couldn't see. We don't even know if he had eyeballs in his sockets. He couldn't see from birth. And I got a few questions about this. Maybe you do too. Is this an invitation to physical healing? I'm not sure if that's the best way to ask this, but let's ask it that way anyway. Is this an invitation to physical healing? We have been, through the Gospel of John, repeatedly encountering people being healed. People, people whose legs didn't work could walk. Uh, pe people whose eyes uh, wouldn't see are now seeing. There's been a bunch of them, but as I've been pointing out as we've gone along, there's a bunch of them, but in the Gospel of John, there are seven that John refers to as signs. Or he elevates them to the level that we're to recognize. That's what's going on. A sign, what's the sign do? It points to... Something beyond itself. In this case, Jesus. That's right. It's pointing to a sign points to something beyond itself. A sign to Calgary is not about Calgary there. It's saying Calgary is this way. These signs are saying you need to pay attention to who Jesus is. And John elevates seven of them. Maybe you recall John chapter two. Do you recall what the first sign was? Turning water into wine. Um, John chapter four. The healing of the officials. Son, that's right, uh, a certain royal official from Capernaum came to Jesus uh, for his son to be healed. Sign number three is in chapter five, the man who, whose legs didn't work for 38 years. Okay, he was healed. Uh, we don't know whether he responds to Jesus positively ultimately or not. Sign number three. Sign number four, uh, the feeding of the 5,000, that's right, plus... Um, John chapter 6, same chapter, is, is sign number 5, where Jesus walks on, walks on the water. 
And, and then here we are, sign number six, John chapter nine, and Jesus heals this man born blind. And a couple of weeks from now, we'll look at sign number, uh, number seven, which is in chapter 11, and that's gonna be the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Now, here's my point. Three, or if you count Lazarus, four of these seven signs are about healing. I think we gotta talk about this a little bit because I've got some questions about this. Why did Jesus heal this man, for instance? Fortunately, he tells us. <laughs> Isn't that handy? Uh, chapter nine, verse three, he, he says he's healed this man so the power of God could be seen in him, or he's about to heal him. So the power of God could be seen in him. The sign points to something beyond itself. He's gonna heal him, but it's gonna point to Jesus. Ultimately, this healing is about Jesus. It also gives us an opportunity to talk about healing because it's kind of a big deal. Uh, I, I don't know if, you've caught, if you caught it earlier when we were reading our way through it, but there's also the, kind of this question of, is there a relationship between sickness and sin? Uh, the disciples, uh, the beginning of, uh, of chapter nine, they said, uh, who sinned? Was this man born blind because, uh, because of his own sin or his parents' sin? Uh, there were only two options that they gave here, what, was that the way it works? Is that what's going on? I mean, at one level, we have to say, is there a connection between sin and sickness? And we have to say yes. Because at the dawn of time, sin entered the world by the choices human beings made. And with it came all of the brokenness, all of the weeds, the thistles, the sickness, the illness uh, that, that waylays humanity. So, so at that sort of global macro level there there's a connection but what about my sickness uh, what, what about what i am dealing with is there a connection between that and sin the disciples seemed to think so uh, they were following the traditions of the teachings of the pharisees that, that it was always connected but jesus says well in this case there's no connection there's there's no cause and effect going on here but, but Jesus isn't teaching here about sickness, is he? Right, like we, we're following a story, an account, a narrative of what's going on, and, and this is one of the things that's going on here. So we wanna be careful, we don't wanna put words in Jesus' mouth that don't belong there. He's teaching about doing God's work while we can. Every opportunity, every opportunity. Now, here's a couple of translations that I think make it a little bit clearer, a little more helpful. Uh, the first one's from New Testament scholar Gary Berg. He suggests that the translation from the Greek should read like this. Um, uh, neither this man, let's get it up on the screen here. Uh, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but so that the work of God might be displayed in his life, we must do the work of him who sent me while it is still day kind of moved where the period is there. We can talk about that more if you're curious. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but so that the work of God might be displayed in his life, we must do the work of him who sent me while it is still day. Now, now look at this next one. This is Eugene Peterson, um, his translation that we call The Message. Um, Jesus said, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There's no such cause and effect here. Look instead for what God can do. We need to be energetically at work for the one who sent me here, working while the sun shines. When night falls, the work day is over. For as long as I am in the world, there's plenty of light. I am the world's light. So Jesus, the light of the world, he's inviting us to see He's offering to illuminate uh, our lives and, and the world around us. This man, his healing, this is about God's glory being on display. Everything is seen in beautiful splendor. Who he is, it's a sign, it points to who Jesus is. How might the glory of God best be seen in your life? 
How might the glory of God best be seen in your life? So, so we ask questions like, does God still heal today? And, and you know, this pastor is going to say, absolutely. You're in an Alliance church. Uh, we've got a long history of talking about this. But absolutely. I'm convinced that God can and does heal today. I'm convinced that James encouragement, James the brother of Jesus in the letter that he wrote to the church, he says if someone's sick, they should call the elders and they, they should anoint them with oil and pray over them and the prayer of a righteous man will, 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 will result in what God wants to do in that situation. Healing uh, can come. So, so, so does God heal? Yes. But because he can and does heal doesn't mean he ought to always heal everyone, right? Now, so, so think about it with, with me in this way. Is it possible that God could be at work in a situation doing something that's more important than bringing healing and wellness immediately? Is that possible? How might the glory of God be best seen in you, in your life, in your situation and circumstance. Can you imagine a situation where his choice not to heal would show even more of his glory and power through someone's life? There's a, there's a fabulous scene that illustrates this in the TV series The Chosen. Uh, it makes this very point. Season three, episode two, if you want to look it up, I've got the link actually to the snippet in the sermon notes. Uh, you'd have to download the PDF to get the link. Uh, it'll be in everything okay this coming week. But here's what, here's what happens. Uh, Jesus had had dinner with his disciples and, and had commissioned them to go out in twos. And, uh, and he tells them that to share the good news of the kingdom of God. And he gave them authority to heal and to cast out demons. Maybe you've read that in, in the Gospels. Gave them authority. Freaked them out a bit. Like they weren't quite ready for this. Uh, but following that dinner, James the Younger, they refer to him as little James in the series, comes to Jesus with tears. You can put that, that back up for me. Uh, he comes to Jesus with tears in his eyes because they've portrayed little James as walking with pain and, and, and carrying a significant limp. And James comes to Jesus and he asks why he had not been healed. So many people had been healed. Why had he not been healed? And the script writers have done just a marvelous job of saying exactly this. There is something, Jesus says to him, more profound that you are going to accomplish because of your disability. The power of God being demonstrated through your weakness. The Apostle Paul says something very similar. The power of God demonstrated through your weakness will accomplish unique and wonderful and powerful things if you will patiently accept the burden. Would I be willing to worship him? Yes, if he chooses to heal me. Or no, if he chooses not to heal me. And then, would I be willing to believe that perhaps he has something even better in store. Now, it's not incidental that the actor who plays uh, little James is disabled. Um, now, now, this is an, imp uh, an imposition to the text. We don't know that James was, was sick or ill, but they take opportunity to make, I think, a very valid theological point in this storytelling. Uh, Jordan Ross is the actor's name. He was born two months premature and grew up with cerebral palsy, sclerosis, and asthma. He had six major surgeries by the time he was 10. And when he begins to tell his story, when he opens up and you can find links online where he actually tells his story, it's, it's, it's as beautiful as the scene that's portrayed in the TV series. How might the glory of God best be seen in you? Now, let's never stop asking for healing. Let's never stop asking that his power would be displayed in us and through us. And let's remember that we're seeking Jesus more than we're seeking the healing. He is not a means to an end. 
What we want more than anything is Jesus. More than anything, more than anyone, as I pray and as I seek him, what I want most is him. And in wanting him, what I want most is that he would be seen in my life. And him being seen in my life, what I want most is that his splendor would be seen and that others would be drawn to the beauty of who I am increasingly seeing him to be. Are the spiritual eyes of your heart maybe being opened a little bit to some possibilities that maybe have been more difficult to see? Is the light of the world illuminating your life and maybe illuminating circumstances and situations around you that you're like, ah, oh, man, I just got to worship him. I just need to believe him and worship him in whatever my circumstance or my situation is. We access his light, water flowing through us by believing him. We pursue physical healing by asking, and we ask in humility, surrendering to his will, to his purposes. And we do these things because the greatest need is the need for spiritual healing. Your greatest need, my greatest need, is the need for spiritual healing. When the man born born blind was brought to the Pharisees, it's this stunning encounter uh, where they are, like they can't see what's going on at all. Uh, they're concerned about how this miracle was affected, um, what laws were broken, is subtext, that's what's going on here, what laws were broken, how many were broken uh, in order for this man to be healed, his sight to be restored on the Sabbath. And they're completely missing the fact that the glory of God has been on extraordinary display here through this man's life follow along. Let me just read a little bit of this. Uh, John chapter 9, verse 16. Some of the Pharisees said, this man, Jesus, is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. Others said, how can an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. That's an important thing to remember. We're going to get, uh, when you get into the book of Acts, you start reading what happens. Some of the Pharisees have become followers of Jesus. Some of them are believing. There's a deep division among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see, so they called in his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him, he's old enough to speak for himself. Now, sounds a little callous, I know. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said he's old enough, ask him. Light versus darkness, friends. Blindness versus sight. And these blind leaders have begun to manage the situation, stick handle their way through the difficulties with threats and with fear. The man who can now see gets understandably impatient. We won't read that part. You can read it this afternoon if you like. He gets impatient with them, a little impetuous, and they're cross examining him. I mean, it's a tiresome story. And, and then they threw him out of the synagogue. They threw him out. Jesus sought him out. Here's what happened. Verse 35. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him. Jesus said, love that. (laughs) You have seen him. And he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord. I believe. And he worshipped Jesus. I've often wondered, like, why does John highlight some of the stories he highlights? Like, why are these ones elevated to this sort of category of signs that, that point to Jesus? Well, and in this case, uh, in this case, there's a full chapter here. Like, this is a long story by biblical standards. Long story, uh, retold. 
In this case, it's being highlighted because it's so profoundly clear. The glory of God is on display. His power is on display in the healing of this man. Not just his healing, but, but, but also then his confession. It becomes crystal clear, not only who he understands the Son of Man to be, but how we are to respond. Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. How have you responded to Jesus? How are you responding to Jesus? Maybe there was a response to Jesus and it's gotten difficult. He hasn't hasn't done the things that you thought he should do or would do. There's an invitation to come back again. Because the first thing you and I need to do is believe. And sometimes that belief has to be revisited, renewed. Uh, In some times we just have to spend a little bit of time with him, rekindling what he asks of us in order that we might stir up that belief once again. We approach him through prayer. Let me invite you to take a lyric here. And let me invite you to um, turn this lyric into your prayer. Can we do this for a couple of minutes? We're going to come to the Lord's table in a minute. Try try this lyric. Try Try this prayer. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see, I want to see. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart I want to see I want to see you Maybe you remember this old prayer Open my eyes, Lord I want to see Jesus to reach out and touch him and say that I love him. Open my ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open my eyes, Lord, I want to see Jesus. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to See you. Lord, I pray for us this morning. We come with all kinds of different needs, all kinds of different challenges, all kinds of different invitations to trust you, to look to you, to believe you, regardless of the circumstances. But I want to pray for those who are facing significant, or, or maybe it's just minor, physical challenges. And I want to pray that you would teach us how to seek you for healing. We would ask, oh God, 
that you would draw near with your good gifts. But more than healing, more than relief from pain or suffering, more than relief from the financial distress that maybe someone finds themselves in and this is the difficulty or the the uncertainty or the unknowing, more than these things, we want you, oh God, we want you in our lives and we want that your glory would be seen. We we want that, that your beauty would be known. And so we look to you and say, more of you, more of you, Lord Jesus. More of you in my life, more of your work, more of your power. And so we come to his table this morning. Uh, we, We come knowing that where this Palm Sunday celebration leads is into a a horrific day that we call Good Friday. We'll gather to worship. We're gonna we're gonna celebrate the Lord's table together. We're gonna reflect on what it meant for Jesus, John chapter ten, to be the good shepherd who lays his life down for the sheep. But but we pause now in the midst of celebration knowing that he is good and that his love endures forever. And so we pause and we recall that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread from the Passover table, he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. Let's us eat together. And then he took the cup from the Passover table and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. And we drink with gratitude saying, thank you, Lord, and worship him. And Paul tells us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim, we declare the Lord's death until he comes because in his death we have life